Hi and welcome to the Cosmic Shambles Network. I'm Ginny Smith and I'm here at Novaspace where there are going to be some parabolic flights and we're going to look at some of the experiments that are going to be going on in zero G. In this episode we're focusing on experiments on motor control and perception and seeing how that might change if there's a lack of gravity. I'm with Adriana now who's working on one of these projects. Can you tell me what it is that you're trying to find out? Okay, here in this project we are, um, we are um, to investigate how microgravity could affect our motor awareness. Okay, so what, how we, we know how we're moving because we can sort of exactly, feel our bodies. Exactly. This is why, because most of the process that we uh, need to perform a simple motor act mm. are mainly, mm, uh, let's say, out of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a great topic in the current cognitive neuroscience and this is one of my <laughs> research field. And we try to understand uh, which is the signal in which, through which our brain could um, uh, build a realistic and veridical motor awareness. So on Earth, if I wanted to do a simple task like reach yeah. and pick something up, exactly. what are the processes that would actually be going on? There are a series of processes actually that you have to do to, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say, to, pl to plan. So you have to decide which movement you have to do, you have to decide the target, then to calibrate the effort. But according to the model of motor control, whenever you are deciding to perform a motor act, there are a copy of the command sent to the muscle in order to execute the movement. Okay. And an order, um, a copy of the order that we go to another um, structure in our brain, which we compare if the um, signal coming from the muscle correspond to the expected sensorial outcome. So did I manage to pick up the glass exactly. or did I miss? Exactly. So I have to mm, know this information in advance. Mm. Of course, we are talking about a signal out of our consciousness, okay? Mm. To study this uh, cognitive function, we build a specific task in which we are able to um, uh, manipulate the feedback, the, the movement that the subject is performing during the task. So this is what people are going to be doing on the plane. Exactly. You, what exactly is the task? What do okay. they have to do? So the task is, uh, is quite simple. The subject starting from a dot starting point has to simply reach a second target. So they're just drawing a drawing line. Drawing a line paper. as fast as they can uh, without uh, uh, take off the pen of the tablet. And uh, of course, the line is registering. Mm -hmm. While the subject is performing the task, we introduced a bias, a deviation, that it could be on the left or on the right. So you're actually moving their hand? No, it's the software that ah. uh, deviates the line. But of course, okay. the subject does not know this because the subject will do the task with the hand behind. No. no. So when you say no, what do you exactly. think you're doing that's different to what it looks so like? So this one's a yes. So when I say yes, it feels like the thing I'm drawing is what I'm seeing. When I say no, it's when I say no, it's like someone's pushing the pen off to one side, like now. So you feel like you're going in I'm a straight having... line and it looks like you're not? Yeah, so I feel that in order to get it to go in a straight line, I had to move diagonally. Okay. In that case. Exactly. So okay. to join the targ, actually, they have to correct the trajectory. Mm. And it has been shown that until, let's say, 14, 15 of degree of the deviation, the subject is not aware about this. So they correct for it. They correct exactly. Wow. Exactly. Uh, it has been uh, mm, hypothesized that they are depending of a parietal frontal circuit, cortical okay. circuit. We expect that since there will be a change in the fluid between uh, uh, during the microgravity, oh. exactly, we expect that the uh, parietal frontal circuitry, circuitry will work, let's say, le with less accuracy. So literally the so liquid that bathes the brain will exactly, be Exactly, beca yeah, because we have not the extraction okay. of the heart, the gravity on the heart. Oh, so what we expect is that during the parabolic flight, they will become aware of the deviation later with respect to what we found in the ground. So it's nothing to do with 
their arms actually moving. It's no, all going it's on all in the brain. cognitive, exactly. Fascinating. So while doing the task, the software deviates the trajectory, and in order to do the task, no. he has to correct, and he's not aware about this for most of the degree. Right. So, <laughs> no. Just sitting down is hard enough. For the brain, it's really difficult to understand no. when you are really doing the task and when is the deviation. This is something that we had also on normal no. gravity. And here we are testing if it improved or it becoming worse. No. And this is all to do with fluid that flows sort of throughout and around the brain. Is there reason to think that if it applies to motor control, it might apply to other cognitive of course. areas? In, indeed, the second task that we are, we are running, in which my colleague will mm. explain you better, uh, basically it is also mediated for the, um, mostly for the parietal side. So okay. we have um, a kind similar of hypothesis because, of course, the fluid change will influence not, all, not only exactly this component, but also other cognitive components. But she will be able <laughs> to tell more who is with me. We're now going to look at the second half of these perception experiments. So can you tell me a little bit about what your experiment's trying to find out? Yes, yeah, so we are trying to study uh, two different components of special attention, but how microgravity affects these two different components. And specifically, we, we are studying automatic orienting of special attention and voluntary orienting of special attention. So attention is something that, it's one of those words that we kind of all feel like we know what it means, but how do you actually define it in this kind of context? In this context, uh, is um, since we use a, a visual spatial detection task, so the subject has to press a key as soon as uh, perceive the presence of a target, mm -hmm. and uh, there may be different cues that uh, help uh, to find this target. So you're looking for something that's going to pop up on exactly. the screen somewhere. Up, yeah, right, on the okay. right or on the left side of the screen. And uh, we're going to have uh, like a visual cue that might, be, might orient automatically attention toward the target. And in this case, we have uh, the box where the target appeared that enlarged. Or we can have a, volunt um, a cue that orient attention uh, in a voluntary way, in the sense that the subject see an arrow in the center of the, um, the fixation cross, uh, which orient attention toward one side or toward the other, where most likely the target can appear. So if there's an arrow in the middle, then I can kind of choose whether to follow that arrow or not. But if something flashes one side or the other, I don't have any choice. My attention yeah. is going to go exactly. to that area. Exactly. Okay. In the automatic task, the, your attention is attracted because there is this salient cue that mm -hmm. attracts your attention. So you are not deciding. It's just something automatic. There's a task you do in the optician where you're spotting dots. Um. And I've spent years doing that test. So the, so the react to a dot thing, I'm really quick at, because, but the, it's a different game, it doesn't, um, the way it works is you're supposed to stare at the cross in the same yeah, way, yeah. but then dots just appear and you have to click where they where, are on the screen. It doesn't matter where they are, you just uh, click when just you see click one. Just click when you see a dot. Detection, okay. a pure detection task. This yeah. is a more a localization task because you, have to you have to, to indicate yeah. whether it's on the right or on the left. Yes. And there's an inhibition and that takes element longer. as well. When that the arrow longer. goes in one direction, then you have to go in the other direction. You've exactly. got to inhibit takes, the instinct yeah. to... Exactly, because because you move your attention toward the left, let's say. Mm. The, and so when the target appears on the right, you, you need time to mm. go back and, and pay attention yeah. because you are not moving your eyes. This yeah. is the important thing to... Do you track people's yeah. eyes? Do you have we, in the lab? Now we don't, don't do it, but in the lab, mm -hmm. yes. We it's like when you're doing a test and you're trying to cheat off the person next to you exactly. without anyone knowing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> not that I've ever done that, of yeah, course. This is, and this is voluntary <laughs> attention. Okay. We also call it endogenous attention because mm -hmm. it's a top-down activity. The other is a bottom-up activity, and uh, it is automatic. Uh, we don't really control it very much, mm -hmm. uh, but the automatic uh, attention, of course, uh, works together with the voluntary. So very often what happens that we are attracted by a stimulus, and then uh, the automatic attention causes the, the intervention of the endogenous attention, and then uh, the endogenous attention works and selects uh, the stimulus, the information, because attention um, so, um, the, the, the role and the function of attention is to select the relevant information and not take care of what is not relevant for the individual. Because we can't 
pay attention to everything that's going on all the time or it would kind of overload us. Yeah, our cognitive system is limited. Mm. So we have to to work a little bit, uh, you know, See what's uh, important not and... to well today in these days we work a lot in parallel multitasking <laughs> and so on but that uh, type of uh, processing is going to decrease uh, the quality of the mm. process so. okay now why do you think that changes in gravity might affect changes in attention because but oh, there are already studies showing that in microgravity the vestibular system is not working very is not working or is working very badly, and, uh, and so the vestibular information works together with the other senses, especially with the visual, the, the with vision. And when the vestibular system is not working, vision uh, has a great uh, has a um, greater uh, weight over the other senses becomes okay. more important, okay. and this may also create some bias. For example, when astronauts try to go toward the floor, they perceive sometimes as the floor is coming up because they ah. they cannot um, uh, they can't feel exactly. that they're moving. And so, but the other thing is that there are already studies on this. The this the new thing about this study is that no, before there were no study on disentangling these two components, and since these two components have very clear different uh, network that control them. The voluntary attention has a more dorsal network, parietofrontal network. The automatic is more lateralized toward the right hemisphere and okay. is more uh, temporal parallel junction and uh, frontal. Sort of so it's area. like here. Okay. Here is the automatic and here is the, the voluntary. Okay. So since they have different uh, neural bases, we believe that, uh, and also the vestibular mm. system arrives in different way to the two uh, networks. We believe that uh, there should be uh, there probably be differences between the effect of microgravity on these two type of orienting of attention. So mm. there is something different from what uh, is going on here on the Earth, and uh, and uh, is, uh, I believe it's very important to know how how these differences affect uh, human performance because when uh, attention is very important for any kind of uh, operation, the mm. astronaut have to. To perform when they are in space and of course they, they should be able to to pay attention to the right thing and to not to pay attention to what is just uh, a irrelevant information a disturbing information once we understand better understood better um, whether uh, microgravity has a, a major effect on one of the two component then we can use the other component to help uh, you know the orienting of attention so changing the way that the systems are set up exactly. when they're driving the spaceship. Do you drive a spaceship? That's but it. also the dashboard, for example. Yeah. You know, like uh, So is it a the... flashing warning exactly. light or is it an arrow that says, look that way? Or... Exactly. And this is automatic attention. Mm. So let's say that uh, microgravity affects um, more uh, uh, voluntary attention and less uh, automatic attention. Then maybe may, we might use automatic attention to help uh, voluntary orienting mm. of voluntary attention, but it may be also the opposite. So mm. we actually have different hypotheses of what can happen. The other thing I haven't said is not just the vestibular system that is missing, but all the brain is shifting up and also the, the, the fluid inside mm. the brain. So there's going to be also a different uh, mm, distribution in blood and uh, um, the blood distribution is also affecting the activity of the brain. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep in consideration both the, um, the absence of the vestibular system, but also other changes uh, that uh, occur in, in this environment. I've never really thought about the fact that your brain would yeah. be floating. That sounds yeah, kind of scary, are, yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, there are very, there are, everything is floating yeah. and the blood, blood is, is mm -hmm. going up. I'm, I haven't, uh, I'm not a physician, I'm a neuropsychologist, but there are now many studies on uh, how the microgravity long-term mission affect uh, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity and the brain. The brain adapts very quickly to the new environment. And so there are some changes which are adaptive mm -hmm. to the new environment. But of course, you know, when they come back... <laughs> you then got to unlearn. Exactly, the... they have to do it. Exactly. If it's true that there is this kind of unawareness of motor action, motor act, 
motor act, motor performing is extremely important also to under, um, understand how it works in uh, microgravity for astronaut because you can imagine you are up there, you have to really be precise how to move, how to adjust the trajectory to catch whatever the object that you mm -hmm. need or also if you have for example to drive from the internal of the ISS an external let's say capsule or or um, tools that you need to fix something outside. So I think that this could have a very important implication for the next step of research, especially for long duration mission, for example, or for the astronaut. Mm. Knowing this, it would be really interesting to get an astronaut's perspective on how this might help them when they're actually on a mission. And being as this is cosmic shambles, that's exactly what we did. Helen? So, uh, Tim, we're here to, I have, very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about motor skills in zero gravity. So on the parabolic flight I did, I had the opportunity to actually mostly watch people trying to work out whether their body was doing what they thought it was doing mm. in zero gravity and how that changed from the hypergravity 1.8 G on the way up yeah. to zero gravity. Yeah. So I'm very curious about your um, experiences of this when you were on your way to the International Space Station and you got there and in your training. So mm. what sort of motor, because you must have really good motor skills. How, was it difficult to translate them to being on the ISS? It is, uh, you do get used to it in a relatively short space of time. Um, but for example, one of the areas we need really good motor skills for is uh, robotic arm handling. So you've got uh, you know, two hand controllers, your left hand is controlling uh, X, Y, and Z axis in, in longitudinal lateral and vertical, and then your right hand is pitch roll and yaw. So you've got this six axis of freedom to, to move the robotic arm, and it needs to be a very careful, delicate operation. Uh, and we do all this training on Earth in a 1G environment, and we get used to that kind of haptic feedback, the spring force gradients. And, and so you can't see your hands while this is... You can see your you hands, can see them. yes. Yeah. But then when, but you're not normally looking at them because you're yeah. focused very much on the screens to see what the robotic arm is doing. Yeah. Um, and then when you go into space, um, it, it, like you'll know on the parabolic flight when you go into weightlessness, your entire body shape changes. Yeah. But you've really noticed it uh, for the first few days on the space station, your shoulders just go up like this because that's right. their natural position when gravity's not pulling them down. Uh, and your, your whole kind of your body position changes, your arms feel so much lighter that your natural hand position rises as well. Right. Um, and then when you're maneuvering these controls, it completely changes the feel that you have on the hand controllers. Um, so we do, again, we practice and practice on the space station so that we can almost recalibrate our brains as to this is now what it feels like um, to, to have that different motor, um, motor force gradient feel back. And did you notice it was different? Like, I'm, I'm assuming that someone has tried to juggle on the International Space Station at some point in a slightly <laughs> different way. But those kind of skills where, you know, you're not really thinking about it, like you reach for something. Mm -hmm. So I did it this morning, and I can't even remember why I did it, but I picked up an apple. I was thinking about this actually, and I passed it behind my back, but I threw it behind my back and I caught it without looking at it. And right. it constantly astonishes you. Like, you know, it's very easy. I don't really need yeah. to go, oh, look, there's an apple in this hand. But, but did you, did you, do you notice any differences like that, that things that, um, as you're moving around, or is it just you adapt mm. so quickly you don't notice? No, you, you do. And of course, uh, uh, there's, you know, you're obviously not catching things <laughs> with a gravity, yeah. in a gravity environment. Yeah. So what you have to get used to, and in particular when you're throwing things to people or passing things on the space I was just going to say, you throw like, things all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, do, we do as crew members, we pass a lot of things around right. and about. And at the beginning, uh, you know, a rookie astronaut on the space station will pass something and it will go into the ceiling. Because you naturally, when you look at somebody on Earth and you want to throw something, you, uh, your brain is doing all those wonderful mathematical calculations to plan the perfect tra trajectory in a 1G environment. Yeah. Of course, on the space station, it needs to be absolutely straight. Right. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's what you're, again, you have to <laughs> recalibrate. Uh, and so if you're just, you know, moving things around as well, you will notice that you'll, you'll suddenly knock things and it won't be going quite where you expected it to go. Because again, your brain's thinking in that 1G. Assuming and it it's going to be falling down. Yeah. And how quickly do you adapt to um, working in different orientations? Because I guess that's part of it as well, spatial awareness. You know, from scuba diving, for example, we quite often work upside down. It doesn't mm. make any difference, but you still know where down is. Yeah. Do you, how do you adapt to knowing where you are 
in, with an extra dimension to play with. Yeah, well, your brain's so good at um, you know very quickly working out a local up and down, if you like. Um, and the space station is designed to give us a kind of floor and a ceiling. I think it's mostly just for psychological um, <laughs> factors. You know, yeah. we don't need to. Of course, you can have any orientation, but it's just. But nice. it's a really clean floor, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very. Uh, yeah, and so you get used to that, but occasionally you'll be working in another module that's off on a different axis, maybe a cargo vehicle has arrived and we're unpacking, and you'll be head down um, towards Earth in this cargo vehicle, but then that becomes your local up, yeah. uh, and then you'll just pop your head through the hatch and, and it'll take you a while to just work out, oh, hang on a second, that's right, recalibrate, this right. is the orientation. Um, but you very quickly get used to that, and soon you'll be scooting around the space station, changing body positions, changing axes, um, and yeah, it's amazing how capable our brain is of being able to flip orientation very quickly. The human brain is terribly adaptable, isn't it? And how about when you come back to Earth in that, that first, you know, because that's, uh, maybe, it's, I don't know, maybe it's easier to go into zero gravity and you've got, it's freedom mm -hmm. in a sense, and you come back and everything's <laughs> Yeah. How, how do your motor, what, what, what do you feel, can you, do you face the same problems backwards in that you case? You do, yeah, and I actually think it's worse. <laughs> um, I, I, I really enjoyed adapting to weightlessness on the space mm -hmm. station. I really didn't enjoy <laughs> readapting to gravity. Uh, the first two days, um, you know, you do, like you said, you feel very heavy. It's very uncomfortable sleeping. You're very conscious of all the pressure points on your body. Um, and, you, uh, you know, I felt uh, pretty unwell, actually, because your mm -hmm. whole vestibular system is recalibrating. Um, uh, and that makes you feel quite nauseous. Uh, right. And you just want to sit very still and not move your head. I mean, anything, any movement like this would have just been so provocative. Um, right. So, uh, and that, that does go, it, but it does take about two or three days for it to, to fully um, clear up and to adapt back to, back to a gravity environment. And I, I think it's the, the vestibular system is kind of switching back on again because in space, your ears are useless in terms of balance. <laughs> I mean, right. it's fine for hearing. But here on Earth, we forget how important our ears are to our balance and to um, our proprioceptive system. And in space, your brain has to switch that off. That's what causes people to be sick when they first go into space. So the quicker your brain can just say, forget the ears, just yeah. look at the eyes, then you feel great in space. And uh, in fact, I did a fun experiment trying to make myself feel sick by being spun <laughs> around and around, and I just what? couldn't. Um, How I many was, somersaults did you do? Oh, did you it must have been a hundred. Tim Copra was spinning me right. around <laughs> as fast as he could. That's a good experiment. Um, yeah, I like I that was, one. I was, reading, I was reading pages from a book as I was being <laughs> spin around. I was moving my head like this, and it was the kind of thing that, you know, I, I defy anybody on earth to have done that and not thrown up, right. and yet I felt absolutely fine. And, and that was after how long? Um, that was after about five months of being So that was a long so time. I've, so I've been up there a long time. So it kind of just proved to me um, how the, you know, my body had really switched off the ears and I wasn't going to get sick. And then coming back down, oh, when it, when it starts, forward roll. Yeah, when it starts <laughs> to then the ears become important again. And I think that's mm -hmm. what's making you feel very nauseous uh, when you get back is that mm -hmm. recalibration of ear to eye. Are there any other kind of non-space applications for this research? Yes, yes. We, we believe that it's always important as all the research, uh, space research has, has always been very important for uh, the art. And uh, we, we believe that uh, if we discover the, the role of the vestibular system in um, these two components of spatial attention, then uh, we can uh, also design uh, better dashboard also for other the environment uh, where maybe uh, the, the attention needs some help mm -hmm. or also we can use with this type of um, result to to find to identify optimal uh, um, design for treating patient that after a brain lesion mm -hmm. have a disorder or special attention and we okay. are studying actually we have been studying this type of patient for a long time so this this information may may help uh, uh, design a good protocol for stroke patient but also for patient with vestibular disorders because there are also patients uh, that have this uh, deficit and the vestibular system doesn't work well and actually we we are now collecting starting to collect also data in patient and we would like to do these studies like in a in a parallel way <laughs> Uh, all 
of the subject experiment defined. So today, very good day, I would say. Thank you for watching. Do please go to YouTube and like the video on there. We like people who like things. And don't forget to subscribe to the Cosmic Shambles Network. And you can follow all the many things that we do. So blogs and podcasts, videos like this. There's lots of live events. There's all kinds of stuff going on all year. So go to CosmicShambles.com to have a look at all of that. And if you'd like to support us, you can do that via Patreon. And of course, just for us being here, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to ESA, to Novus Bus, and especially to our Patreon supporters. That's what enables us to come here and share this with you.